great. Hello! I hope I'm on right now. Oh, there I am. Okay, cool. Uh, my name's Joe. I'm so excited to be here. This has been such a great day. Um, and I hope everyone has a blast. Anyway, um, if you don't have a cat, stick around. I still think you'll learn some stuff. The point is like to try to just get into like IoT. I just want you to like show you with this like goofy weird project what I've been working on. So uh, let's just like get started. We only have like 25 minutes here. So let's see what happens. Okay, gonna switch this over. Boom! IoT and JavaScript. Uh, my name's Joe, MongoDB, software developer. Liz already introduced me. I'm gonna go fast through this. If you do wanna find resources though, I do have links there, that bit.ly link, IoT kitty litter box, or that QR code up in the, I don't know, wherever the right hand corner of that slide there, you should go check that out. Um, I'm on Twitter, it's the best way to get a hold of me. Joe Carlson one. Um, I post a lot about JavaScript. Performance, speed, of course, a little bit of database stuff. I've worked for MongoDB, I have to, right? Um, and I'm on TikTok. There's like three software engineers on TikTok, but I post funny videos about software engineering. Um, unfortunately, I do not dance much, but uh, if you ask me enough, maybe I will dance. Who knows? Uh, and my website. Okay, lastly, if I say any controversial opinions here today, please know they're my own. Uh, don't get me fired. I like my job a lot, so I'd love that. But um, all these, all my opinions are my own. Great, let's jump in. So, what are we gonna be talking about today? I wanna give you first a quick introduction to IoT. I'm sure you probably know about it. We're just gonna go fast through it. Then I wanna to try to convince you why you should consider using JavaScript and Node for your next internet connected project. Um, or your first. Lastly, or um, then I wanna go through like a project I worked on. This is a goofy, stupid little project, this IoT kitty litter box I made. Um, I wanna show you like what I did and how I built this project. And then lastly, I want to talk about the future of IoT. I want to make embarrassing. I'm going to watch this in like five years and be embarrassed about the wild claims I'm going to make. Uh, so I'm going to be doing that here. But I think it's cool, kind of like speculate about the future. That's a halfway informed opinion, but uh, based on my research and opinions about working at IoT projects. So let's jump in. What the heck is IoT? Well, it's basically anything that we connect to the internet. You probably see we've been connecting a lot of shit to the internet recently, just like putting a internet connected chips and toasters and blenders and juicers and toilets and everything, right? Um, my personal favorite part about internet connected things are kind of the stupid projects. I love that line between just a totally genius and a totally just piece of shit, stupid idea. Um, I actually ran a hackathon in Honolulu, Hawaii called the stupid shit and terrible ideas hackathon. The point was just to, like make fun stuff for, with me and my friends. It was so much fun. Like um, someone made an app where you only takes photos when you shake your phone, so it only takes blurry photos. Or a six foot square fidget cube that was totally useless. Or e stupid projects. Someone made an e-commerce site for artis artisanal shit, which was super fun too. Um, anyway, I love stupid art projects. And art. Oh, I got sound coming through here. Um, but. I think my favorite part too is like, and I think us as engineers, we have this unique position to explore this new dimension of art that hasn't been previously explored before. As technologists, I think we can do that. And I feel like not a lot of tech people are into that stuff. I hope like, I just want to inspire you to maybe make something fun just for yourself after you watch this talk. I think that we as developers are one of the only people that can do that right now. Or it is, it, we can we can explore this new dimension. I love that. I think that's amazing. That it, it never ceases to blow my mind. Okay, so uh, JavaScript and IoT. Why the heck should you consider using it? Um, turns out there's lots of reasons. Turns out there's lots of reasons. So Node. First of all, did you know that over 58% of respondents, IoT developers, self-identify as Node developers. That's a quorum. That's already a quorum of developers that are self-identifying as IoT developers. What? Secondly, this is this is a personal opinion of mine, and I don't want to slam any languages. Not my intention, right? But I think JavaScript makes a great choice for new developers. And if you want to get into JavaScript or IoT hardware projects, and you know JavaScript, like you came out of boot camp, you've been teaching yourself, right? It's the internet. It's the language of the net. Why not make a project with the language you're already comfortable with? Like learning hardware, is, you have, there's a lot of new concepts and ideas you have to learn while you're picking that up. Just 
why make your life harder, right? Traditionally, what we see is with IoT projects and what you might have thought of is using lower level programming languages like C or C++. Great. And there's still benefits to using those today. But my personal opinion is these are difficult to learn. And it's because you have to deal with all these memory management stuff. It's so hard. There are benefits, like they're smaller, lighter weight. You can make them faster, more optimized. There's no garbage collectors. There's a lot of great reasons to use it. But whatever, if you're making a project for yourself, even for like production level sites or IoT projects, Node can still be a great choice. You're just making some handoffs. Again, just, it can be great, right? Secondly, easy to update over a network. Traditionally too, with hardware devices, if you wanna make an update on that chip, what you have to do is go get it, plug it in, reflash that with the new operating system, that new code. JavaScript's easy. You can update your IoT projects now just like you would with a web app. Just do a git pull, npm install, baby, you're done, right? That's super easy to script and run and deploy massive updates over a network. Piece of cake, baby. Internet already speaks JavaScript. What the heck? Let's just keep using it. Let's keep using this thing. It works. What's wrong with that? And you may not know this already, but there's already a super vibrant ecosystem of tools, libraries, plugins, and APIs available for IoT developers who are using JavaScript and Node. The two biggies today are Cylon.js and Johnny5. Um, for my IoT killer box, I'm actually using Johnny5. Uh, we'll be going into that code more in depth in just a little bit. Second, or what is it? We're in a fifthly, I don't know. JavaScript is amazing for handling event-driven applications. So I want you to think about how you design IoT projects. And you may not know this if you're new at this. No problemo, no worries. But um, for example, let's say I'm making a, let's say I'm making my, my internet connected litter box. I have a scale and it's waiting for a cat sized object to enter that box. So what's happening is when that cat sized object hits that scale, I want to do some sort of event. And JavaScript and Node is based on events at its core, right? And we're doing that via callbacks. And we, of course we can do promises and async await or whatever, right? But like when this, we wait for something to happen, then we run some sort of callback or function after that event has been called. Think of it like a DOM event. I'm clicking on the DOM and we have some sort of callback function that runs, right? Asynchronous applicate, that's the foundation of Node and JavaScript. And it turns out IoT architecture is actually works super well with the architecture of how Node and JavaScript is built from a core level. Okay, great. So IoT and JavaScript and Node, um, tons of amazing reasons why I should consider using it. Um, there's great reasons to use other low level languages too, but just think, think about it. If you're watching this, you're probably already a JavaScript person. Just like maybe keep, keep using it, it's fine. Okay, this is my favorite part though. Let's jump in. Um, IoT kitty litter box. Let's talk about my, 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 this fun, goofy little project I've been working on. Uh, so this is actually the box. Um, it's fancy as hell. I bought a little fancy, like postmodern, uh, what's mid-century kitty litter box? Totally extra, you don't have to do that. Um, but you could totally just use like those cheap little enclosures and get on Amazon for like 20 bucks or whatever. Totally, totally legit. But that's the, actually the finished box and my dumb cat sitting on top of it. Um, his name is Beemo, if there's any Adventure fans out there, Adventure Time fans out there. Uh, but that's the box. Okay, I thought this was a dumbass idea, but it turns out it may not actually be that bad of an idea. I was trying to think of like a fun project I could get into to like talk about IoT, and I came up with this thing. And it turns out to be a super useful project for me personally. But you can actually buy fancy kitty litter boxes. And if you look at that price, like that's $500 on Autopets. That's how much that thing costs. It does the things, I think it auto scoops too, but like it does everything I do. It does a little extra, but I, I didn't have to pay 500 bucks. It cost me like 40 bucks to make this dang box, okay? Nothing, that's cheap. Make your own, plus it was fun. I learned a lot about hardware and the process too. Oh, okay, so let's, I wanna talk about how this box actually works. So I have a little loader box. Again, you can just use a cheap one. We're gonna be just showing how it works, but um, what happens is when that box is opened, or I slide the door open on my specific box, I go into maintenance mode. And maintenance mode means I'm either gonna be adding additional glitter or I'm gonna be cleaning the box. But all I know is like, I don't wanna take any scale measurements while it's in maintenance mode. So it basically shuts it off and we, oh, 
we wait for that box to close. Once that box closes again, I know I'm ready to wait for a bathroom event to occur, right? So we reinitialize the new base weight of the box. I basically have a fancy internet connected scale in the bottom of that box and it measures some weights for a cat size object, right? I don't know if it's actually a cat. It could be an opossum, it could be a raccoon, a small person, but some sort of 10 to 20 pound type creature to enter that box. And if it detects it, then we need to do something. So let's wait for that. You have the base of the box. We're waiting for that small creature to appear. Oh, here he comes. Here he comes. Cat detected or something. I don't know, but it's did something detected. And then once it waits for that object to happen, it takes a passive measurement of my cat's weight. So we, like it waits a little bit, waits for him to settle down, then it takes a weight, and then we pfft, fire that off to the cloud. We take that with a timestamp measurement and the weight of the animal. Um, so I can measure his weight over time. Cat does his business. Once the cat leaves, I wait for a little bit for everything to settle down again. Then I reinitialize a new base weight of the box. And then I wait for a new event, whether it's a maintenance event or a cat using the box event, event again. Cool. All right. So that's how the box works. Um, I want to jump into it. Just like a little bit of code. Just like a little bit of code. Let's go see how that looks. Um, I forgot I have sound on this thing. Um, so the first step for any IoT project, you got to do a hello world. You can't not do a hello world. And a hello world for an IoT project like this, or any really, is just making that LED blink on and off. It's basically just like making sure your hardware is initialized correctly, your code set up all correctly, all that stuff. You can see I'm running this on a Raspberry Pi 3B plus. It doesn't take a fancy one though. You can see my little scales over there. This is the actual project, me building it from the ground up here. I have some extra circuits around there. I have everything tied up to a breadboard so I can kind of like set up my circuits. Um, I also want to say too, I'm not an electrical guy. I had to Google the shit out of all this stuff. How to like wire up an LED on a Raspberry Pi. I don't know how to do this stuff. Um, but it took a lot of Googling to figure it out. And that's okay. That's okay. I was learning how to do it. So what does it actually look like with the code to get that to blink? So I'm using Johnny5. Johnny5 works with a bunch of different circuits and board and hardware. And you can do a bunch of amazing stuff with it super easily. So with Johnny5, I just requiring in the NPM package. Then I'm just saying, Johnny5, hey, use that Raspberry Pi. Can we want to interact with those the GPIO or the general purpose input output pins, which is basically how we're interacting with the real world. We say there's something happening on these pins. But we initialize that brand new board. We say, hey, it's a Raspberry Pi board. And we have a asynchronous event that runs when that board is like ready. And all we're doing is saying, like, hey, on the 13th GPIO pin, I had to Google to figure out what that was on a Raspberry Pi. Don't tell anyone. Um, and then we just say LED blink. <coughs> There's a built-in function with Johnny5 to handle with a bunch of common hardware. I'm not using anything fancy. Um, I just say, hey, there's a LED hooked up on GPIO pin 13. Turn her off and on. And that's and that's how you get to, that's it. That's it, that's the hello world. It's like feels really complicated, but it really isn't, right? Like I had to Google the pin and how to set the circuit, but like the code is super easy. I think it's easy for us to understand too as no to JavaScript developers with asynchronous events they're waiting for. Okay. So we got it. We got our hello world. Let's make this dang toilet work. All right. Let's do some fun stuff here. Um, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to initialize that board and it's on, it's ready. But instead of using an LED, I'm going to use a magnetic switch. That's how I'm telling what's in its maintenance mode or not. Um, so I basically just say when it's open or closed, I need to change the state of the application to either be true or false. And I need to do certain things when that happens. So let's see how this actually works in progress. So I have my laptop up there, it's hooked up to my, my code here. I'm going to open the board. You can see that little white pin on the side there. That's the magnetic switch. It's just waiting for that to open and close. And you can see I'm opening and closing the door and you can see on my laptop, it's registering those open and close events easily, right? So just hooking that up. I can track that on there. Easy piece of cake, no problem. Okay, so that's not too bad, that's easy, that's easy. I do wanna to get to my favorite part there. This is the load cells. I learned a ton about the load cells here. So, um, full disclosure, I couldn't get this dang thing to work, right? I couldn't actually get my GPIO pins to work. 
Uh, or for a lo these load cells. I, I bought them at Alibaba. They were like super cheap and I couldn't get them to work. But I did find a Python package that could get it to work. I tried a bunch of different stuff, including setup bits on Python server and then a web socket and connecting them up. The architecture got really crazy. But the fun part here is I got to actually utilize Node's core ch spawn child process library. This was dope. And if you don't know, basically what this is, it allows you to spin up a separate thread and I'm spinning up a separate thread with Node to run Python and then send that Python code directly through to my Node code. So everything's run through one code base. I'm just spinning up separate processes. So if anyone tells you Node is single th threaded, it technically is, but this spawn child process gives you, allows you to do multi-threading on a server level with Node. Things get complicated really fast and I wouldn't recommend it, but it worked extremely well in this use case. So what happens is I'm running my, my, my Node server for my Flutter box and I have, I spin up a separate Python thread that's actually reading the load cells and I send that data back to my Node application. So how do we do that? You can see I'm actually doing the spawn and I'm saying it's a Python application and I give the location of that file that I want to spawn up on a separate thread. And then what happens is on, in order to get the data from that Python code up to the parent thread, I just do things to standard output. So just print them out to console and then on the process.standard on, on the node thread, you just say when there's data coming in through the, to the console from that Python thread, just read that in as regular data. So I read it in, I parse it in, it comes as a string, I parse it to a float, and then I update that weight to the application. I'm just waiting for that cat size object to enter the box. You can do things like error handling and close through, but whatever. The interesting part is the data, handling the data. And that's it, that was weird though. That took me forever. But let's take a look how that works. Um, so you see that piece of plywood? I actually have the bathroom scale underneath that piece of plywood. And it's measuring that weight. And I'm pressing down on that piece of plywood this is a terrible video, but in a second you'll be able to see how I'm actually registering the weight changes from that piece of plywood onto my internet connected litter box. So I can start reading those numbers directly from that scale and do work based on it. I had a little helpful notes there in case you didn't know when I pressed because my terrible camera work. But it was amazing. I am so proud of this part. This part is so cool. I can't believe I got that working. Okay, I'm a Node developer working for MongoDB. I have to talk about how we're saving this data. And for me, what I wanted was a dashboard so I can keep track of my cat's weight over time. Right? I want to be able to measure it, see if there's any weird changes. And I also want to travel and make sure that pet sitter is actually cleaning the box so I can keep track of these vents over time. I used a internet uh, or a time series data data schema. And I want to kind of show you why a MongoDB document actually makes a great use case for IoT developed projects and for just development and process, right? Like the, it, the flexibility and structure is just perfect what I needed. So I designed my time series schema based on my dashboards. And I, what I wanted was a graph and I wanna show number of times the, he goes to the bathroom every single day and his weight changes every single day. I wanna see his weight over time every single day. So I designed it. So every single day we create a brand new document in my MongoDB document or database. I have some metadata about my cat. Um, and then I have an array and I'm basically every time there's a bathroom event or a maintenance event, I just push that with a time series thing and some additional data, uh, of what he is. So this, in this example, I can't went to the bathroom twice in one day and I clean the box once. I have timestamps for both of those. And then each of the bathroom events is accompanied by a weight. So I can graph those out and every single day, it makes it super easy for me to graph it. The point is here. I wanted to design the schema based on how many reading it and I'm gonna be using that data. I also wanna make sure it is scalable. I don't wanna have too many events, like I don't wanna scale that out to infinity. They're nice, compact documents and it fits the model of how I'm gonna be using that data. The other cool part too was how flexible the schema was. So I didn't really care about my old data. When I added that maintenance event in there, I was able to update that and I didn't have to worry about my old schema because it was old data anyways, which is very typical for IoT data. Right? We're just kind of streaming. I want to see a real time view of what my sensors are picking up and maybe just like some overall data of what's happening. I could do that piece of cake, baby, easy. All right, so let's look at the final assembly for this box. You can see my Raspberry Pi. I just kind of screwed it into the side there, assembled the box up, plug it in and boom, that's it. Everything hides away super easily. It's, it's great, it's kind of a mess in there, but like, hey, what the heck, you know? I'm the only one that's gonna really see that. Maybe my cat sometimes, but he doesn't care. And that's it. Works great though. I still use it every day. And that Sam, I had to trick him with so many treats to get him on top of that box. 
Okay. Here's the part. I'm going to wrap up here and make some wild speculations about the future here. So, what do I think is going to happen to the future of IoT and JavaScript? First of all, I think we're going to continue to see smaller, more powerful devices integrate into more things. Duh. Not a lot. We get it, right? And we're going to see, we're seeing things embedded into clothing more, more wearables, smaller watches, more battery. We're going to see more of this in the future. The other part of this too is a lot of IoT data is going to be crunched on the edge. That means on the device that's actually doing the reading, a lot of the data analysis is going to happen on that device. Right now what happens, we just send that raw data to a centralized cloud server and it's just a massive data crunching for that. Especially if it's handling a fleet of IoT devices and it needs to do a bunch of data collection and analysis and analytics on that. You really can't do it on the edge, but I think we can see more of that in the future. We're gonna see JavaScript with a smaller footprint and better optimized for IoT device, devices. Uh, right now, right, the, the garbage collector, and there's jokes right about Slack and Chrome just destroying RAM and like making our, our computers go off into the ethos, like ethosphere, I don't even know what's a word, right? But like, we're gonna to continue to see greater optimization for hardware and embedding. We'll see better hardware support. Like I was saying too, I couldn't get my actual load cells to actually be working with Johnny5, but I was able to get it working on Python. I think we're gonna to continue to see greater hardware support in the future. And lastly, this is for every IoT device, but the main bottleneck is not like hardware and code. The main limitation is actually power and batteries. And especially as devices get more powerful, that also means they're gonna be requiring more power and because they generate more heat. And batteries are and continue to be the bottleneck for our applications, which is an issue. Okay, so if I've inspired you at all to be a JavaScript master, or to try out your first JavaScript IoT project, or just IoT project, whatever, without that, how do you go about doing that? Okay, so I'm terrible at this, I'm biased, I, I, I've heard this is terrible advice, but I recommend just get the heck out there and do it. Like, just make an LED blink, try something, make a project just for you, you don't have to sell it, you don't have to monetize it, just make some stupid thing that you like just for you. I made this thing back here. It's just like an LED that turns on and off. It's internet connected though. But it's just for me to make to have fun and to learn how to do some of these hardware projects. Um, I think all of us need to make more things just for us. And I feel like in this industry, we're pressured to monetize the shit out of all of our side projects. But like, screw that. Just make something fun for yourself and try it out. Uh, thank you. I got a couple minutes here. Um, but again, if you, have, uh, if you want to find any of the resources, including video of this talk, my, these slides, any links I have reached in here, code, check out that, that bit.ly link. And again, if I if you like hanging out with me at all and you want to see more, follow me on Twitter, follow me on TikTok. I'd love to hang out and chat with you more about IoT, code, so any career stuff. Just I want to just hang out with y'all. I love, I love hanging out with you and talking about code. And uh, more stuff there. And uh, that's it. Anyway, thank you so much, everyone. I had so much fun. I had a blast. And I'm going to turn it back over to my gracious hosts again. I love you all so much. Bye.